It really was, yes. Some of the um, the sessions I attended were often around the idea of sort of open data, open access, open culture. This idea, not of not of stealing other people's content or refusing to pay for it if it's creative, for example, but the idea of making everything as available as possible, um, particularly in terms of knowledge. And this is where uh, data and uh, scientific papers, for example, come in. So that everyone can benefit off them. Mm. Well, the, uh, the fact that so much scientific data and indeed scientific paywalls, are, uh, scientific papers are put up behind journal journal paywalls, mm. is a huge barrier to the public uh, trust and understanding of science. Absolutely. Um, when climate change, I hate to use the word skeptic, so I'm not because they're not <laughs> skeptical. When climate change deniers. Mm. Um, come up with their ludicrous things, um, it's very difficult for scientists to say, ah, oh, but if you just read this paper by such and such a person, uh, you'd be able to, mm. to see that it's wrong. And then they go and try and read that paper, but find they've got to pay at least $50 behind some paywall just to read it. Just to have a look at it. That's, you know, that, that erodes trust. It really does. Um, as, especially as well when so much of the data gets hidden. Even if you pay to get to the, the article, you can't see the data, the raw data it's based on. So, the mm. idea that um, more and more um, universities, more and more academic institutions, are releasing both their data and their papers in an open way, and that they've got the mechanisms to do this, I think it's just, it's it's one of these world changing. It it really things. is, yeah. And and that leads us on to um, the bit where we just discuss a couple of the cyblogs posts of the week. And, and the first one is by Fabiana Kupke. She writes Building Blogs of Science, and it's about Open Access Week, which was this last week. And um, so it's dedicated to to everything open access. The the idea being particularly in science, again, sharing one's not only one's scientific papers but one's data, because not all data ends up in a published paper, for example. Um, and she shares the exciting news that um, the Journal of Health, uh, sorry, the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Um, and they've got a new feature on the JMIR website, uh, which is called Open Peer Review Articles. So what JMIR users can do is they can sign themselves up as peer reviews for specific artic um, articles currently being considered by the journal. So you're sort of crowdsourcing your peer review. Now, I don't know if that would always work. Um, generally, the idea with peer review is that the reviewers are experts in whatever the field is that the paper is about. But it's certainly a very, very That's interesting... The word. Oh, yes. Peer review. Yeah, yeah exactly. But I think it's certainly a really, really um, interesting idea. And, and there are already a number of open access journals out there that are doing quite well. Well, let, let's face it. Um, it used to be the job of experts to compile uh, encyclopedias. Yeah. And yet the, the crowdsourced Wikipedia has been proven at least as accurate as mm. the Encyclopedia Britannica, for instance. Indeed. So, you know, these experiments are... Uh, excellent. It, you know, if this works, this yeah. is um, a good way forward. Absolutely, but it is, of course, scaring the uh, the current science publishing industry. As it should. As it should. As it's it should. it's a disruptive it should, technology. Should, mm. uh, uh, we've we've had we've seen this ever since the the internet was born. Precisely. And and there there are a lot of people who who are quite happy about this. Um, I did hear said it was it was quite interesting that. You know, one of the problems is is we, we educate all of our young people and, and we want an innovative economy. And as they leave university, they no longer have access to all of the knowledge resources which they did while they were at university, yeah. making it very difficult for them, if nothing else, to, to stay on top of their field, to continue to upskill, to, to have all of this access yeah. to information, let alone somebody, you know, in a city or in a rural area who might have a lovely idea but, again, does not have access to the kind of data which would allow them to potentially do something interesting with that idea. Yeah. Well, it's it's just the, the old-fashioned way of, mm. of restricting knowledge. You know, the idea that knowledge is power, therefore you've got to, to keep it. Yeah. Um, but I, in, in, a, uh, in the Internet-enabled world, it isn't really. The sharing of knowledge is power. Mm. A community that shares its knowledge for free will evolve faster than a, a community which keeps its knowledge in little silos. Absolutely, I, I completely agree. Um, and 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 as as one journal is is doing quite nicely. Well, sorry, not so much a journal, but the Royal Society of London, um, much beloved and ancient science body, has announced that um, from 
from this year, uh, what they refer to as their world famous journal archive, because they do. I mean, they've just got the most extraordinary pieces of science, uh, sort of papers that have been written over the last few hundred years. It's, there's more than 69,000 uh, yeah, papers. Dating from 1665. That's when they start, right. Mm. I'm, I'm fairly sure they've got some of Newton's original papers and things in there. You can read this lovely sort of scratchy calligraphy and stuff. But it, they're all going to be, anything older than 70 years is going to be permanently free to access. You can go and have a look at it. That's awesome. I just wish you'd said seven instead of 70. Yes, well, I, I think we'll get there over time. <laughs> but uh, a lot of this is just its so beautiful to go and have a look at, at, at how papers used to be written as well. And, and, and then, you know, there's typesetting and mm. you can get into the fonts and all the beautiful little diagrams. They're, they're just absolutely exquisite. Yes, yeah, some, the some of the works there are papers by Franklin, Newton. Boyle, Huxley, and Darwin. I mean, how cool to be able to actually go and have a look and see what yeah. they did. And you also know that there's going to be some pretty funny stuff in there as well. Some of the earliest uh, uh, experiments around things like electricity and stuff are probably going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so we look we look forward to uh, to going and having a look at all of that. Um, that's pretty cool. And with that, I think. We're pretty much done otherwise. Does that draw us to a close? Pretty much, other than uh, just quickly looking at a couple of the events coming up this week. Uh, the first one is <coughs> a talk on Monday night in Wellington by Rebecca Priestley, <coughs> excuse me, entitled Mad on Radium, New Zealand and the Radiation Age, because of course New Zealand is not uh, nuclear free. Well, of course not. We have smoke detectors. <laughs> um, every single one of them is a small piece of Americanium. In. <clears throat> exactly. Uh, we have hospitals that use radiotherapy. Mm. Um, the, and indeed, it, uh, I, could, I could be wrong on this, but from stuff I was reading <coughs> earlier on today, um, I don't believe it's actually. <coughs> there's nothing against in the, in the laws in this country against nuclear power. It's only nuclear weaponry and nuclear ships that were actually banned. Although. I don't actually think that there's any uranium cycle nu nuclear technology mm. that makes sense in a country of four million people well, no. that is geologically active. Um, yes, and considering we have such marvelous other or natural playful. resources. Playful is. Playful. Geologically playful. playful. <laughs> Useful and, and still, you know, having a little bit of fun hasn't settled down yet. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there is a talk on Tuesday. Um, entitled, oh, sorry about that. There's a talk on Tuesday called Climate Change Impact on New Zealand Health, Property, Infrastructure and Industry. That's going to be in Wellington as well. Um, so that should be quite interesting. If you are interested in climate change, uh, Dr. Jim Salinger is going to be speaking about it. Um, so worth, worthwhile getting along to Jim generally knows what he's on about. Yeah, so that's true. But they're, they're not bringing along the uh, the comedy relief, the you know, new Sasha Baron Cohen <laughs> character? <laughs> no, we, th there's a marvellous video out there. Um, uh, for anybody who doesn't know who Lord Christopher Monckton is, he's a very famous climate change denier. And uh, some Australians, well, Kelvin, tell us what they did. Well, they they basically worked on the assumption that, that Lord Christopher Monckton did not ac actually exist, but was merely Sasha Baron Cohen's latest comic create. <laughs> <laughs> comic character, <laughs> and then and then proceed to interview him as this, and and he's just completely confused. He has no idea what's going he's on. He's wondering why they're asking him if he's determined to stay in character through the whole interview, <laughs> and, and if he'll give them leave. a quick aight. Yeah, <laughs> it's well, 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 good fun. Uh, we got a bit of a giggle out of that. Um, then on Wednesday is the Oxfam Climate Change 2011 election debate. That is up in Auckland. Again, well worth going into as we spin up into election cycle or, or something. And then on Saturday is the Antarctic Society National AGM and Council meeting as well. So, sorry, do we spin up into the election spin cycle? I believe so, yes. Very, very heavily <laughs> looking at what's going on at the moment. But yes, um, I will I will leave it at that. Thank you, as always, to uh, Science Media Centre for their gear um, and to Ranchian for his music and to Kelvin for coming along today. Oh, thank you for having me. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone.